<laughs> okay, we seem to be doing well with uh, getting all the people in, so we'll get started. Um, we are recording this, and you can also record it, I believe, on your end, uh, attendees. So um, hopefully, uh, we'll share a lot of things that will be helpful. Um, all right, so I figure out, I got to get my pointer in the right place to switch slides here. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm Dr. Kelly Knippel. I'm a developmental optometrist from Brookfield, Wisconsin. We also have an office in Madison. Um, and uh, my specialty is working with functional vision. So we work with a lot of problems with, that people have with how their eyes work together, how their focusing system works, and um, their eye movements and how they perceive uh, visual things and use their vision. So basically anybody that has any issues with that, whether it's somebody with a brain injury or sports vision or somebody with an eye turn, but the main emphasis in our practice is working with children who struggle in school. Uh, we work a lot with um, children who uh, can be described as smart in everything but school. Uh, they seem you know, of normal intelligence or better even often, but they just are failing. And so a lot of them are uh, maybe thought to have ADD, maybe thought to have dyslexia, nobody can figure out what's going on. Um, and a lot of times they have a problem with their vision. And so we, we spend a lot of time working with, um, with functional things in terms of helping them get better, um, but also just tips. Uh, and most of the tips that are helpful for attention and learning, uh, many of those things are great for everybody. So we, um, we're here today to share uh, in this situation where people are trying to uh, do school at home, um, I can only imagine that there's a lot of problems going on. So, um, so my, my practice, the Vision Therapy Center, we've been around for 25 years now, which I can hardly believe. <laughs> and um, I've actually known Sharon Michio for quite a bit of that time, Sharon, right? <laughs> yes. So um, Sharon is, is a teacher. Uh, I don't know if you were always a fourth grade teacher, but all the time yeah. I knew you first were and fourth. fourth. Your first and fourth. Yeah. That's right. So, um, so uh, I've um, I met Sharon actually through her children, which I know she doesn't mind me sharing. But um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we we uh, worked with her daughter first, and we had some uh, some excellent success. And so we've had a wonderful collaboration all these years. Um, and Sharon's going to be here to help just put in some comments from a teacher's perspective that maybe will help you with uh, what you're trying to deal with at home. So Sharon, do you have anything else to add? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was awesome. And I'll um, definitely be here all the way through to the end, especially if you have questions, um, curriculum, classroom, whatever, you know, um, at the end, so. Yep, excellent. So our goals today, we're working on, we're basically gonna be in three parts with a question and answer at the end. And the first part, we're going to talk about creating an ideal learning environment, um, which is really going to be more of the setup. Uh, the second part, keeping your kids on track and working efficiently, is going to be more about, uh, about what do you, how do you go about doing that, and then stay organized and sane, just some tips for scheduling, organization, and, and different things that hopefully could be helpful for you. And of course, we're going to try really hard to leave a lot of time at the end for question and answer. So um, we'll, we'll have a way that you can submit your questions as we're going along here. Okay, so why are we talking about this? I think I, I already talked about that somewhat in the introduction, but um, the big why about why are we doing this webinar today is when I really thought about kids trying to do school at home, it just really hit me that there's uh, going to be a lot of children who are having headaches and eye strain and things they maybe didn't deal with before when uh, the, they were in a school setting. So why is that the case? Um, one of the reasons is because 25% of all children have a vision problem that affects their ability to learn. Um, and that's 
you know, when I first learned about this, and even now when I think about it 25 years later, I think it's kind of astonishing that it's that many. Um, I think Sharon can attest to this. When you start looking and you look at kids in a classroom, um, it's not that hard to find them because of the symptoms. Um, and some of them are the things you're going to be seeing at home now with kids trying to work on computers all day or just doing near work all day. Um, in a normal classroom setting, um, we always say a high percentage of information in the classroom is presented in a visual way. Um, the number that's set often is 80% in a normal classroom, but now children are really almost 100% learning through their vision. Um, one of the things that's important to understand, and we'll talk about this later toward the end, is about the vision issues. What are they? Um, but typical vision screenings only find about 20 to 30% of the vision problems. So there's lots of children that are struggling with their vision every day. Um, and, and again, some of the symptoms are going to be headaches and eye strain, um, things like having to get really close to see your screen. Um, you know, I'm imagining these kids just uh, looking uh, trying to keep going and trying to keep working when if they have a functional vision problem, that would be impossible to do. So um, we're going to uh, talk about some things that you can do to alleviate some of those issues. Um, obviously, we can't fix the problem by just doing tips at home, but you can do some things that help work around the problem. Kelly, I just wanted to throw in really quick to as you're talking, if people have questions and answers, there's a Q&A um, box um, that should be on everybody's screen where you can um, write down your questions and then we'll get to those later. Uh, great. So yeah, write them down as we're going and we have moderators who will pick out the most common ones and, and ask us and the most interesting ones. <laughs> um, okay, so the first section, create an ideal learning environment. Our goals here are really comfort, reduce physical and visual fatigue, and really be able to do productive work for a longer time. So how do we do that? So first we're going to look at the workspace, then we're going to talk about visual stress reduction. How do you set up things so that there's less visual stress? And then a quick glimpse into some other factors that might help in your environment. So the first thing that I think is really key, um, when kids are doing a small amount of homework at home, it probably doesn't make too much difference. I mean, it does, but, um, but they'll be able to work, you know, even if they're lying on their stomach looking at their Chromebook, like something that makes my skin crawl when I see people doing that <laughs> because they're, they're always too close to the screen. But they can probably get away with doing that for 10 or 15 minutes um, but really, ideally, we want people to um, have a desk or a chair that uh, is the right size for them. So sitting at the, the breakfast bar or even sitting at the table, the, the dining room table is usually, it's higher. Um, for eating, you need a higher surface than you would if you're a kid trying to read a book or look at your computer. So what we want is they need to be able to sit in good posture. And this is what Sharon and I were talking about earlier. If you were in, yeah. we were talking about that. Your feet need to be flat on the floor. And um, so the 90 degrees means that there should be a 90 degree angle. This person in my picture over here is, is leaning forward a little bit too much, but the, the hip joints, you know, where that bend is and where the knees bend should be both 90 degrees. If you have that, then you at least have the right support with your chair. Um, the, the feet flat thing, I, I learned this from a, a little girl. She was probably six or seven years old. And um, I have been working with her for um, the previous school year. And then the new school year started. And her mom said the teacher is just complaining because she just keeps falling out of her desk and they don't know if she they don't think she's fooling around but she keeps falling out of her desk why would she fall out of her desk so it she was a girl with special needs she had cp so that does affect your your body you know how much strength you have in your body to support yourself all day 
but she hadn't had the same problem the year before. So that didn't really explain it. Um, and so luckily it popped into my head that maybe her desk was the wrong size and her feet, you know, maybe she was, it was just the wrong size. Could her feet touch the floor? And the girl kind of said, no, I can't reach the floor. <laughs> and so the janitor adjusted the desk and sure enough, she didn't fall out of her desk anymore. <laughs> so just a really good sign of, you know, your feet should be flat. Um, and if you do that, then you can last a lot longer. Um, just, I'm going to go on about this a little more. When I was in optometry school, we had some rows of seats in graduate school where your feet didn't reach the floor either. And so we would all rush to get to school faster so that we got the rows of chairs that your feet could reach <laughs> um, because we had to sit there for several hours a day. And so um, it was really difficult to stay still when your feet are dangly. All right, the most important visual thing is the next part is the Harman distance. So this girl in the picture shows what the Harman distance is, which is the distance from your elbow to your knuckle. Um, and so you should be at least that far away from your book, your things you're writing on, and especially your computer. So you're working on your, your uh, Chromebook or your computer, you want to make sure that you're not that your children are not really leaning in or that you aren't either. And you, uh, farther away than that distance, here's the distance, farther away than that is okay, um, but closer is not okay. Um, if your children or you, if you have trouble maintaining that distance, often that is a sign that there's a functional problem with your focusing or your eye teaming. Um, or maybe you just need glasses, but, um, but it, again, if you can't do that, that would be, um, something to uh, that should prompt uh, an eye appointment. Um, the other thing that we can see in these pictures is there's a slanted surface. So if you're working on a computer, then you can control the slant and most people will put it where it's easiest to see. Um, when you're reading a book, you want to make sure that it's propped up. And if you have anything with you that you can look at, if you put it flat, and then if you put it up, you'll see that it's just much easier to see if it's up. So the other thing that I recommend is if you are doing some work with a computer and with papers, then you really need to um, figure out which one is the most important. Um, I think I have this on the next slide is we need you to be straight ahead. So you want to be looking straight ahead and you'll need to decide which which uh, your computer or your paper is most important to be straight. Um, I do have this picture of, we have these in our office and I'm really not recommending that you necessarily go and get one, but uh, it's just a nice picture of um, how these chairs adjust as children grow so that their feet can have support and then, um, then they, can, they can sit and they can sit at a higher table um, and still have good foot support. All right, so other things with the workspace that's set up is lighting. So you do wanna make sure you have light in the room. Um, we use full spectrum light in the office um, and recommend that if possible. Um, with your computer, you just, uh, pretty much we naturally do this, but you wanna make sure that the glare from the lights or the windows isn't on the screen and also not in your eyes. So if you're, um, if you're trying to work and you can actually see the light bulb from uh, wherever the light bulb is, then that glare is bothering you. So you might need to put a, change the lamp or move it to a different location so that, uh, that it's not actually bothering you. Right now I have a light shining at me just so you can see me better. And that would be super annoying and fatiguing if I did that all day. <laughs> um, your device shouldn't be the only light. For, so for older children, uh, high school, college people, or you as an adult, um, you want to have some room lighting on so that you can have more awareness of your space. And we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, but you shouldn't be just looking at your phone or just at your computer and everything else be dark. Um, some of the people who prefer that 
usually it's because whatever the other light source is, is glaring into their eyes from where they like to sit. So just investigate that, uh, the, the glare issue or the placement of lamps um, to see if you can keep some room lighting on. If you put the light behind you, then it lights up the room, but doesn't glare into your eyes. Um, your computer setup also, you want to have a place that you can look far. Um, and so something where you can look out the window frequently or that there's a lot of space behind if you have a great room or a, a bigger space. Okay, um, then other visual stress reduction things which are very specific for vision. So we already talked about the Harman distance. Um, and I started to mention about straight ahead. So you want both eyes to be able to equally look at the screen. If you like to do things like this or, you know, slouching or turning your head, then if I do this, you can see that my two eyes can't possibly work together equally while I'm, while I'm doing that. So if I, if I keep my face straight and I don't tilt or turn my head, then both eyes can work more efficiently together. Um, if you do things like this too long, it actually can lead to a change in your vision and cause you to end up with a problem that you might not have had before. Um, space around and behind the computer. So I talked about that you want to be able to see. And I also mentioned with the room lighting that you want to be able to be aware of the space. So if I, while I'm reading, if I can also be aware of the space behind the computer and really all the space, then that is something that helps my focusing system relax. We can actually do things where we can look at people and see how their focusing system is working. And then if they try to be more aware of their surroundings, we can see that their focusing system relaxes. And if, if you are someone who's not typically aware of that, if you can look at your computer and then try to pay attention around to all the space, you might even be able to feel that it helps you relax your visual system. So this is something that you have to remind yourself in the beginning, but that you can turn into a habit. Um, the slant board we already talked about. Um, I was just thinking about since people are at home that you may not have a slant board. Um, a three ring binder, a three inch three ring binder is about the right angle. So that can work, or you can just find something if you prop it up about three inches in the back at the, you know, that angle, then that'll be about right. And basically you just want to set it up so that it, um, that it feels really comfortable and looks good to you. Um, you will see that lots of children who get very close when they're writing on the flat uh, kitchen table or um, whatever surface they're using, if you slant it up, they often will sit up and they will naturally be at the right distance um, when they use the slant board. If, if they really don't have a problem with their vision, then that usually happens. So then the setup is, is key. Okay, so this is kind of a, a hodgepodge of list of things, but other environmental factors can really play a role. Um, you know, how cold is it? Some people like to be a little colder when they're learning. Some people like to be uh, warmer. So, you know, you might actually discuss that a little bit. Music. Um, some people say, oh, you should never have music. Um, I always, I studied best with music, but music that didn't have words. Um, so if there's lyrics going on and I wanted to sing along, then that would distract me from my work. But if I, um, so I often plays, played jazz and opera and classical music and stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, but that kept my, that helped me, my brain would kind of keep with the rhythm and keep going. And there's something that was good about that. Um, what I was talking about this with one of the doctors in my office, she actually likes to play country music with people singing when she's trying to really concentrate. So. Um, so it's not always true that music is distracting, um, and I would say actually the opposite, but you have to find the right, the right kind for you or for your, for your child. Um, just because, you know, if it is, they do want it for distraction, obviously don't, don't use that. 
Um, color is something that's pretty interesting. We do a lot of work with, uh, with doing treatments with different colors of light. Um, and so there, and there's a lot of research in psychology about what colors to use for, you know, for decorating and for restaurants. And so, um, so if you want to be more alert, then you're going to use more yellows and reds and whites. Um, you be in an environment that have that. If you want to be more calm, so if you're, uh, you know, if your child tends to be more movement prone, then you want to stay out of places that have reds and yellows and you want things that are more like greens and blues or more calming colors. And so um, I, I, when I first moved into my house, I had a room that I painted navy blue on one wall or two walls actually, and I painted bright yellow on one wall. It was really pretty, but if I was needing to, uh, if I wanted to go to sleep, I would not sit facing the yellow wall, I would sit facing the blue wall. <laughs> and if I really needed to pay attention and get a lot of work done, then I would sit facing the yellow wall. And I, I didn't really understand why I did that till I started um, studying the, the colored light therapy. And I realized that it really, it, I, I was using syntonics. I was using the color to help myself. So you might want to look around and, you know, the playroom where you, you might have put brighter colors um, might not be the right place for trying to study. Um, all right. Hydration, obviously, make sure your kids are drinking enough water, good diet. Um, there's a, some studies about scents and aroma that uh, you can if you study with peppermint, for example, that maybe using the peppermint when you're taking the test will help you remember things. <laughs> I think that um, there's, there's a lot of things to that, which we won't go into right now, but um, exercise, you know, people are not getting outside as much as they should. Um, sleep, limiting other digital device use. If your child is doing way more computer work than they did before, they really should be limiting how much time they're spending on their phone. Um, and phones is one of my pet peeves. People tend to not put their phone at the Harmon distance. They have, almost everybody holds it closer. So that's a big problem for being able to, uh, if you're doing that a lot and then you're trying to do computer work for your schoolwork, you should you should really balance that out. Um, attitude, we're going to talk about that later on. Okay, so the next section now, keeping your kids on track and working efficiently. Uh, we're going to speak about visual stress reduction actions and, and talk about time. So visual stress reduction actions. So um, the, uh-oh, I just... I just messed up my screen. There we go. Um, the visual stress reduction actions, we talk about just taking consistent visual breaks. Many people may have heard about the 2020 rule, which is really a 2020 rule. As optometrists, we of course like, uh, we like that <laughs> because of 2020, but what you're supposed to do is every 20 minutes, you should actively look at a distant object that's uh, 20 feet away at least for about 20 seconds. And you really do want to make sure you take a break where you stop thinking about what you were doing and where you actually look actively far away. So your vision is an action system. You have to move in order to look. And so you want to utilize that. The reason for this is that your, when you look close, your eyes have to turn in to look at something closer. And then there's muscles in the inside of your eye that work to focus so that you can see close. So you want to periodically and regularly look away um, so that your eyes straighten out and your focusing system shifts back and relaxes to that far away. Um, I was shocked to learn when I was in optometry school that, that you had to work to look close and relax to look far. Um, I'm nearsighted, so I need glasses to see for far away. So I always thought that it was work to see far. And in fact, it's the other way around. So you want to make sure that when you're doing a lot of near work that you look far very frequently. Um, so for, for most normal adults, 20 minutes and 20 seconds is 
is fine. Um, for children with functional vision problems or anyone with functional vision problems, you probably want to follow the 10-10 rule, which would be every 10 minutes. Then you don't have to look as long, but more consistently. And with, when you're working with your children, you might, um, you know, once you get their desk set up so their feet are flat, flat on the floor, then you might want to see what is kind of their normal rhythm of when they need a break. Um, it could be because of their eyes. And so it could be that they really can't focus for longer than 10 minutes. And that, so if you find that they really do try to work hard, but they're working and then they get a drink and they work and they go to the bathroom, then they work, then they play with the dog, then they work, then they find something else. If that's your child, then you want to set up the breaks so that they're taking them um, maybe right before they would normally or that you just plan that and that it's okay. Because if you have a vision problem, you cannot possibly keep looking. If you realize that that's the reason, then I think mentally it's a lot easier to deal with it, that it's okay to get up and move around because that is what, what they need to do to get their visual system functioning again. Um, then that, um, that is something that maybe can be helpful. Okay, so what you want to do then is plan these movement visual breaks. Oh, the other part is, is movement. So every hour, um, you want to get up and move around for about five minutes. Um, and so the uh, basically, our bodies are not meant to sit in a chair for hours and hours. Our eyes are not meant to sit and look at the computer for hours and hours. Um, there's a lot of studies on attention, and for the most part, about 45 minutes is about the longest people have really good attention. So if uh, with a normal, again, adult or older child, every 45 minutes to an hour, they should absolutely be getting up and moving around. Um, so in, in school, you might want to think about they have recess, they're changing classes, they get up and walk to the next class. Um, and so I, it sort of made me laugh when I thought about this a few weeks ago, like they should get up and walk to their next class. <laughs> so they should go and walk around, look far, go outside if possible. Um, so you want to plan also with younger children, 45 minutes may be too long. So um, you may be taking breaks every 20 minutes or so. So Sharon, I don't know if you have a thought about like fourth graders. Yeah. How long did you typically do a class or yeah. a study period? Yeah, it would depend. I mean, some would be like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe 45. But then we always tried to do, um, we were lucky where I taught and we had smart boards. And so we would put like a, some fun music up on the smart board and we would dance. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, you know, those that wanted to, or they could just stand up, you know, walk around the room between just to get moving. Um, and we also had those balls that you sit on, um, stability balls. Mm -hmm. um, so their feet had to be flat on the floor. Otherwise they would fall off their right. <laughs> stability ball. So they could bounce on that if they wanted to during the, um, during the musical break. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, so, and that's a good example. Plan what you're going to do in the breaks. Um, so, you want to incorporate things your child would like to do. Um, and you also want to set boundaries. So like that musical break she was talking about, the song is probably a certain amount of time and then yeah. it's done and now yep. it's time to get back. Yeah. So something that gives you something to get back. So um, this is my nephew shooting baskets. I'm in their house. They're all basketball players. They probably go out and shoot baskets frequently <laughs> in between studying. Um, but I would uh, encourage people to decide, you know, are they going to, how many shots will they make? Um, or how many shots will they take? Uh, we like to count make shots in my family <laughs> or made shots. Um, but they could jump on the trampoline. They could go play catch. They could just run around the house once or twice or um, run down to the mailbox and back or um, they, uh, if, if it's raining outside and you can't go outside, ping pong, cornhole, just throwing bean bags, hitting a balloon back and forth. Um, so you might come up with all different kinds of ideas, but your basic thing is you want to do something that requires depth perception and movement so that 
uh, we're really getting the motor part of our visual system really working and changing where we're looking, changing distances so that we can go back and concentrate on our one distance again. One more thing to add to that too, really quick, Kelly, is that especially for littler kids who, um, you know, maybe in school, they'll listen to the teacher when they say, okay, song's over, we're going to sit, but we all know our own kids push it with parents. So I'm um, just foreshadowing that like, okay, when this song is over, we're going to go back to work and then have them repeat it. Okay, what's going to happen when the song is over? We're going to go back to work or we're going to run three times around the house. What's going to happen then, you know, just so that they know you're foreshadowing so that they're not like one more, one more, you know, right. <laughs> oh, what did we both say? You said it too. You know, we'll do it again in 40 minutes or 30 minutes or, you know, 10 or 20 minutes for some kids. <laughs> right. Excellent. And that's an excellent segue into the next part, which is, does your child understand time? <laughs> right. <laughs> so good work, Sharon. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, um, so one of the things that I think we find frustrating uh, or parents are frustrated about when they're talking to us about their children is that um, is they often don't really understand that the child doesn't understand time. So you need to investigate this a little bit because children are pretty smart. So they often can look like they know what you're talking about when they don't really know what it is. Um, or, you know, they don't really know, do they understand if I say one minute from now, I need you to be sitting in that chair, do they actually know how long that is? Um, how long is five minutes? Um, so there are some different things you can do to work on that. And so there's two things that I put here. And one of them, um, this is something, if you're having trouble with the child setting their own schedule, you may need to start with this, is they need to find out how long things take to do. So whenever I think about this, I always think about getting ready in the morning because you know sometimes I'm just rushing around and sometimes I'm just leisurely, right? So I know to the second, pretty much how long, how, what's the fastest shower I could take, <laughs> or what's the fastest I can get coffee ready or get my breakfast ready. Um, and I kind of know how long it takes if I do it more leisurely. So I can speed up or slow down depending on when I have to be somewhere. And so um, this is something that as adults, we can all relate to because we've had years and years and years to work on it. Um, so a seven-year-old doesn't really have that, and they don't really, most of them don't really know how to do that. So um, you can use a stopwatch or a watch with a second hand and just start timing things and asking, how long do you think it's going to take to do that? This can actually be a very fun thing to do. Um, and you can do it with just normal things like how long will it take to put on your shoes? Or how long do you think it would take you to set the table? Um, but you can also do it with how long is it going to take you to get that math sheet done or that assignment that you have on your, you know, from your computer that you have to do. How long do you think it's going to take you? And then they time themselves and see, were they right? Um, <laughs> so with some children, it actually just starts speeding them up because they can start noticing. Um, and you want to start with short periods of time that are seconds to minutes, like 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, things like that. Um, and not things that take like 15 or 20, then it's much harder. The other thing you want to do is start asking children, what time is it? You know, so pretty much most of the day, I have a pretty good idea, probably within 10 minutes or so of what time it is. Um, and that's because my day, well, relies on appointments. So I have to be ready for the next person within for sure 30 minutes. Um, so I, I have to consciously be aware of time all the time. So I'm pretty good at it. Other people don't really need to do that. Children really don't need to do that. So you might want to start working on that if you want to work on, um, on organization. So that gets us to our next part is trying to do a schedule or organizing and trying to stay sane, if your child doesn't understand time, then you're gonna have a lot of trouble with them organizing themselves. So I would say work on that first. If they do understand time, then these next sections will maybe give you some tips. So we're going to talk about organizational styles and working together to set a schedule and attitude here. So, um, 
So the main point in, in this section is just to really understand that organization is a skill. So some people, just like any other skill, some people have kind of a natural talent toward it. Some people are probably the opposite, um, but everybody can get better at it. So if you, um, one thing that, that we spend quite a bit of time talking about with parents um, in this, this kind of conversation though, is organizational styles. And so sometimes people are very into how they like to organize things and they wish everybody else would do it their way because it works so great. <laughs> and, um, you know, as a business owner, it's always interesting to try to put my organization into my workers and see if they can, they can follow what I want them to do. Sometimes it works way better if I let them figure out how it should be organized so that it's the way they like it because then they'll do it. Um, and they'll understand the, all the processes better. And it's really not because one is better than the other. Often it's just the way that we like to do it helps us. It, it's because of how we think. So some of that is because of time that we talked about before. Some of it is just uh, how your, your brain works. So you really need to realize that your style and your child's style may not match at all. And so if you're trying to impose your organization on them, that, that may be why things are failing. Um, one example I like to give of that too are, um, you know, spouses, your husband. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, wives usually laugh when I say this <laughs> and the husbands as well. If you want your husband to do something, you figure out how to tell him or give him the list in a way that he likes and so that he will do it. If you tell him in the way that you like, it usually doesn't get done. But if you tell him in the way he likes, and I'm sure husbands can say the very same thing, they want their wife to do something, you know, they figure out how to talk about it so that, uh, oh yeah, okay, I'll do that. Um, so it, and, but it, a lot of that is really about organizational style. How do they like to organize their day so that, or their week so that they can get things done? So, you know, you might think about that if you're the mom and you're, um, your child that you're working on organization is a boy, you know, there may be some things you think about in a little different way. Um, and really, it can just be anybody. Uh, try to get them to think about what they would like. Um, so what you do need to do, though, is you need to share options. So you can say, you know, some people like to put every subject in a different folder. Some people like to put it all in one. You know, so you need to share different options. Um, and the other thing I would suggest with that is why do they want to do what they want to do? You need to figure out what's going on in there. What are they thinking about? Is they might have some really good ideas about, it might sound strange what they want to do, but it might really actually make sense. And hey, so, Kelly, I'm going to break in for one minute yeah. and just remind everybody, because this is, a, they might be thinking of questions that you can put questions in the Q&A box. Um, and the moderators are have some questions already, but they were um, just wanted me to remind you. Ah, uh, great. People out there. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so the last thing I'm going to say about this is try to think like a coach. Instead of being a parent telling them what to do or a teacher teaching them how to do it, you want to try to coach them. So you'd think about what are they doing really well. Let's keep doing that. You know, how can I? figure out how to get them to do something different. And so here's, um, I think my last, oh, I'm getting close to the end here. Um, when you work to set a schedule, try to have the child have as much input as they can and um, evaluate at the end of the day, this is where the coaching comes in. What worked? What did they do awesome at? Make sure they know that and make sure they can self-evaluate that yes, indeed, that was awesome what I did make sure that happens again. If you start working on the things that didn't work, sometimes you forget to keep doing the things that did. So really emphasize that. And then what didn't work, why do you think it happened? Um, I put on here, failure could be the answer. So 
I always, I, I, I tell my students, failure equals excellence. <laughs> you know, you can't be really good at something if you never fail. If you're always perfect, you're just not going to improve. So, so that's what I mean by failure is you might just fail. You might just have forgotten or something happened that got in the way. And so if it was a good idea, just try again tomorrow, do it again, just recognize that, oops, and then let's do it again. But the failure could also mean that it was a really bad plan. And the reason was because, you know, something was always going to be a problem for that. Then you could evaluate and say, okay, maybe let's try it a different way tomorrow. Um, okay, so the other thing is we, in vision therapy, we try to break down tasks, break down visual skills um, into smaller parts and then gradually put them together. So. Um, you, something that works really well is trying to use an 80% success criteria. So if you're, um, you know, what is something that they can actually, what is a part that they could actually do almost all the time correctly? Start with that and then gradually add more things. Start with the favorite things, the easiest parts of the schedule and gradually add on, okay, now you do that that way because you like that. How could you apply that to this thing that you don't like as much? All right, so Sharon's going to talk about um, attitude and a couple other things here. Okay, um, so Kelly and I have talked a lot about this over the years and um, just from being in the classroom for so many years, obviously a positive attitude is really helpful for learning. Um, smiling, laughing a lot, even when things go wrong, learning how to laugh at yourself and let your kids see you do that. Like, oops, you know, mom or dad messed up and okay, well, that was kind of funny. I'm going to try it again. Um, just that fun, relaxed environment. It's not going to be perfect. Um, no classroom is perfect. And certainly, you know, schooling your kids at home when you weren't expecting to do that is not going to be perfect. So, um, just keeping it as fun and relaxed as possible is fine um, and best for everybody, including you. You'll feel a lot better at the end of the day too, um, being able to do that. So, um, and just noticing what is correct when kids do something instead of, you know, oh, I saw on that quiz you got two wrong. Wow, you got eight out of 10, that's awesome. You know, I'm super proud of you. Um, it just, kids, notice that it really makes a huge difference in how they learn and when your brain is feeling happy and positive you actually learn more and better so we can talk more about that in the q a too but yeah so sharon do you know how to make yourself smile when you when you don't feel like smiling how did i ever tell you that i don't know pencil in your teeth in your mouth <laughs> on it and your brain thinks you're smiling oh wow <laughs> So I do believe there's research on that, but even if not, it always makes kids giggle. And yeah. So if it can make you, if you tr can make you giggle while you're doing it, because it's so kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of research about like um, if if you smile at people, how it completely it can change their brain chemistry too. Yeah. It changes their day, so it it does make a big difference in how kids learn. All right. Oh, so your next slide here. Okay, yes, great. Okay, so um, you know your kids best. Um, you know, just talking to some of my kids that are, are schooling their kids right now at home, um, they're trying to do it just like they, they know their kid's teacher would, and, and you don't have to do that. Um, you know them best. Maybe your kid is a total night owl and they need to sleep in till nine every day. I, I think that's okay. Um, if that's what they need, then you can get stuff done around the house while they're sleeping. That's a win for everybody. So they need that ownership of their schedule, sitting down. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have done this already because you've been doing this for a while now. But um, if you sort of need a reboot or whatever, just that ownership of making their schedule. What do you think will work for you? Even little kids have quite a bit of self-awareness. And if they have some ownership of their schedule and when they think they should start uh, their day, that that could really help. Um, uh, a special spot for supplies. It's just always good to have a basket or some sort of place where they put all their stuff there, you know, if they're working on an iPad or whatever they have from their school um, and their books and pencils and 
markers and all that stuff. Just at the end of the day, it all goes back there. You put it away, then you just know where everything is instead of, oop, that's up in my room and that's, you know, on my bed because I was doing that and then that's out on the back porch. So just having that special spot. Um, and then just, again, just going back to one more time, circling back to just being you, um, you know, your kids love you and, um, and it's okay if they say, that's not how my teacher does it. You know, you can say, well, that's okay. You know, I'm not your teacher and you can ask for their input. You know, what helps you? What do you like that your teacher does? Does your teacher do something that you really like? You know, how can I best help you? Just having that conversation. Great. Them, thank you. Um, I think can really be helpful. So that's my tips. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. All right, so really quickly, I already talked about what is vision a little bit before. Um, and one thing that is very important in thinking about functional vision is that 2020 vision is just how small a thing you can see 20 feet away. It really doesn't tell you anything about how your eyes work together, how your focusing system works, how your eyes can follow something when you're reading and keep your place. And so those are all things that um, w at the, here at the Vision Therapy Center, these are things that we test in addition to visual acuity are all those functional skills. If you have problems with those, you may end up with headaches, eye strain, blurry vision, double vision, losing your place a lot. Um, attention problems is a symptom. So a lot of children who have, and a lot of adults as well, who have these problems, learn to stop working before they end up with, with blurry vision or double vision. Um, and so sometimes kids don't have that, but usually those are children who can't really keep looking for a very long period of time. We also do a lot of work with visual perception, space perception, depth perception, understanding uh, visualization, visual memory. Those are all things that are important for all these things we're talking about, <laughs> about making a schedule, for example. Um, if we find that there is a problem, we might prescribe lenses. I talked a little bit about colored light therapy earlier or optometric vision therapy is um, people come in the office regularly and we, we work on skills and then we send people home to practice things. Um, and uh, we can make huge changes with children who have functional vision problems where they just go from failing to being very successful students. Um, if, if their academic knowledge is there, then um, just getting their vision working usually makes a huge difference. You can find some more resources on our website, so I just put that in here. And we also have a vision quiz if you're curious about whether um, maybe you or your child has a functional vision problem, then this is on our website. There's a set of symptoms and you can kind of rate them and see um, if it's something that, that might be useful to come in. So in summary, we talked about creating an ideal learning environment, setting up the workspace, setting up the visual setup correctly. Um, we talked about visual stress reduction actions of taking regular visual breaks to look far and also getting up in regular movement breaks. Um, that understanding time is a key thing for being able to organize a schedule um, and some tips for organize, organizational skills and styles. And uh, hopefully some other little tidbits in there that, that you found helpful. Um, we are during this time, um, just at, it's completely a uh, COVID special um, because uh, so many people are at home, we're offering that we would do a Zoom meeting or consultation with you if, if you have a lot of questions that we're not going to be able to answer today, um, then one of the doctors here in the office would do a Zoom meeting with you where you could kind of show us what your setup is, we could give you some tips, um, and we could maybe give you some very personal uh, tips on what might work with your child. So we're offering, offering that at a $99 special price, um, hoping that we can just give you some help um, in this time at home. Um, after this, check your email for um, the uh, link to the vision quiz, the at-home sign-up, this presentation. 
And also we have a vision guideline screen time thing that you can print out that has these on there. Um, and Sharon found this and I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> so I'll put that up there while we field some questions. Do you have anything to add though, Sharon? Um, boy, you covered um, things really well. I think we'll leave it for questions right now. And then I had a couple things at the end if we have time. Let's see. Right. So do you have the question? I, I can see the one is, um, do you have screen time recommendation limits, not just for school, but for everything? Um, that's a great question. So um, for for young children, I mean, for very young children, the even the pediatrician associations really recommend no screen time up to like age two, I think. Um, and so I certainly couldn't argue with that. I, I would agree. Um, for young children, we usually tell people in our office 30 minutes. Um, for older kids, we usually say an hour. Um, but that's just that's for fun things obviously school and work that's impossible so i recommend very strongly once you get past an hour trying to balance especially for children balancing out visual uh depth perception eye hand coordination moving around activities um some of the kids who just say ah but i really want two hours or if i want to watch a movie on tv it's two hours um they can balance that by going out and playing basketball for an hour or playing ping pong or doing things that are kind of the opposite. Um, and so, you know, so, so you can, you can balance it out and give yourself more time. Um, if you're somebody who's working and you just need to uh, be on your computer all day, then you just really need to faithfully follow the tips we gave before about looking far frequently and getting up and doing movement breaks. Um, possibly a standing desk. I think we forgot to mention that. Um, you know, in my office, I've got some people who have standing desks or desks that actually go up and down. So sometimes they sit and sometimes they stand. We try to get people moving around the office as much as we can as well. So hopefully that answered. Um, is there a device or app to download to protect the vision from lengthy use of the screen? high school, middle school, and fourth grade. Yeah, um, I think most people find that setting alarms is the best way. Um, and really, it's mostly just trying to get in a good habit um, so that, uh, you know, so that you just are regularly doing it. Something that will remind you. If you work in an office, if you take phone calls, when the phone rings might be a good time to look far. I see, can blue light from digital screens harm the eyes and what can be done to protect them? Well, that, that's an awesome question because we do a lot of work with colored light um, and we actually use blue light a lot to relieve headaches. So when the blue light recommendations came out, like, hmm, yes, it's true that um, blue light at night keeps people awake. So um, it really has more to do with um, how it affects your nervous system than actually harming your eyes. Um, and so you can use some different um, apps that make your screens change to more of a reddish color at night. Um, I really recommend trying to stay off your screens at night and trying to you know, two hours before you go to bed, you should really be turning off everything if you can. Um, if you can't, then wearing blue light blocking glass, glasses in the evening makes sense to me. Wearing them all day does not make sense. Um, blue light, when you go outside and the sky is blue, and you know how good that feels when the sky is really blue, part of that is because of blue light. So uh, hopefully that answered that. Kelly, what do you think of those glasses that some people get to protect their eyes from the screen? Well, that is what that that's the their blue light blocking. Okay. So, yep. So I would not recommend wearing those all the time. The research on them is there, but it's not it's not awesome. 
Um, and I say that be, especially because of the light, the light treatments that we do. Um, so, so yes, I would, I would say to wear them, but not all the time. Okay. So like partially during the day and should kids ever wear those or not really? Um, well, I would prefer that they mostly are not using the screens as much. Yeah. So if they're using their screen during the day, I don't really see a big reason to use that. Um, if they're using their screens late at night, you know, if they're a teenager or somebody like that, then, then yeah, I, I could definitely see a time where I would think that could be appropriate. Um, all right, so I think those are the main questions. Does anybody see any other? Oh, just one about music. Um, if they're using music in a smaller space with siblings, um, headphones? Well, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, that is the challenge, isn't it? To try to set up the environment for everybody. So, um, it may be that people could, could, uh, all be benefiting from whatever music is being played. Um, but yeah, headphones would be fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, okay. So, um, There'll be an email going out that will have um, to the recording of this, I believe. Yep, so everybody so, should check their email for that. Yep, check your email, check your junk mail if you're looking for it. Okay. Oh, let's see, one more question. How soon and how much of a difference would a person see in making the changes you recommend? Well, if you... Um, so for example, the girl who was falling out of her desk, just putting her desk the right size, the, the change is instant. Um, if you make, um, I had a patient once who I went through all these things with her. She was in a PhD program and she was getting headaches and eye strain. And I went through this and she said, I'm doing everything exactly wrong. She was getting too close, not taking breaks. So within a week, she was tremendously better. Um, we prescribed glasses for her as well for near, and that helped tremendously as well. But her, everything turned around for her within a couple of weeks um, from a very serious problem where she didn't know how she was going to finish her schooling. So it really depends on what the situation is. If you have a vision problem and you're doing everything, your setup is all wrong, you could make a difference uh, really quickly. Um, yeah, I've seen plant folds make a big difference too. Yeah, if you have a vision problem, then uh, and we don't fix the vision problem, then you could do all of these things and still have a huge problem and still get headaches every day. So um, that would be the time once you've changed everything um, within a couple of weeks. If things aren't better, or you know, if you're getting headaches, then you want to uh, you would really want an eye exam, and so. Um, if you're in our area, we are open by appointment. So, um, you know, we can help you right away if you recognize that you've got some serious issues going on. And then there's one more. Is it okay for my child to read using their finger to guide them? Oh, yes. So um, if, if they're using their finger, that usually means they need it. So I, I definitely do not recommend getting them to stop. Um, they'll stop when they don't need it. Yeah. And you probably realize that like I use my finger sometimes if the print is small and there's lots of stuff. So we use it when we need it and we stop when we don't. So um, yes, I would encourage them. Many, many, many kids do that and need it. And it's very helpful for beginning readers, especially, or for kids who are, reading bigger books now with the print smaller and closer together. Um, yeah. Definitely. Some even benefit from using a bookmark under the line of print. Yep. If they're overwhelmed by a whole page of print, that, that can be really helpful to kids as well. Yep. And I would also recommend trying on top because you really do want to be able to see what's coming up. 
And so if you read efficiently, you're looking way ahead of what you're saying, or yeah. you can read paragraphs at a time if you're, if you're really efficient. And so, um, so for some people that doesn't work very well because they just get distracted by what's coming up because they're trying to look ahead. <laughs> but anyway, I, do, I recommend trying both ways to see. All right. So uh, let's see. Oh, you're welcome. Someone said thank you. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> please, please ask us uh, if you need anything else there about Landon. <laughs> we'll try to help. Do you have questions? Um, like I said, we do have that offer open that, you know, if you really need some help and you'd like some input on your specific situation, we're happy to help you. Um, and you'll get all the information for that in your email. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank Sharon, thank you for contributing. You're welcome. My really pleasure. I haven't seen you in so long. It was yes. awesome. It was great. <laughs> um, so thanks very much. Have a wonderful Bye, day, everybody. Bye.